Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Julio for inviting me to come to this meeting. I think uh, translational research is at the heart of uh, success in terms of solving mental disorders, and that's what many of us are looking at in addition to neurological disorders. Um, it's a challenge. And what I'd like to present today is the relationship between translational research and what is now being seen as personalized medicine is looking particularly at a person and coming up with an appropriate therapeutic treatment for that disorder, whatever it may be. And I think we have to push ourselves to move in this direction. And personalized medicine has been coming up slowly, but I think it's now here and we have to see if we can make it work. And translational research, I think, I worked at the NIH for a number of years, and I think we first started talking about it in the late 80s and early 90s, and we said people had to do more tra translational research. And the answer from the field was, well, what is translational research? And I think I have some definitions that I'll offer up for both translational research and for personalized medicine as we go through this. And I, I think I have some thoughts about ways that we may be able to accelerate some of our progress as we move to understand the brain and the, and the disorders. I apologize for the uh, vagueness in this cycle of uh, definition of translational med research, but it also is a little vague how you actually do this and the arrows should be going in both directions. And in particular, at this meeting, we've heard an awful lot about what I would say is good translational research, but it's always coming bottom up into the clinical area. I don't know how much goes back down into the basic area from the clinicians. It would be good to think about that. But overall, the primary goal of translational research, as we, as we, as we have heard, is bench the bedside. And I think it is, as I just said, that direction, and we need to get more going back to the bench so that basic research scientists can think about enhancing the clinical research efforts. And I think integral to all of this are collaboration and data sharing and integration and coming up with standards. I think we are, as a group of people, unbelievably creative and we all like to do our own thing. But I, I really believe that if we're going to solve the problems that we're working on, we have to start doing more standardization and keep doing individual efforts of research, but also combine our efforts together. Now, personalized medicine is a medical model that's emphasized in general, the customization of healthcare. And we're looking to do this because a lot of our healthcare is not good enough, and we believe that diseases are variable enough ac across a disease pattern that we have to look at the individual patient and make our prevented efforts and treatment unique. And I think translational research is core for success in this area. Now, who is personalized medicine critical for? Well, obviously, at the top of the list, it's the patient and consumers, but it's also critical for clinicians, diagnostic development, drug regulatory system, healthcare delivery, and pharmaceutical discovery stakeholders. Why, why do I feel it's urgent to do this? Why do many people feel it's urgent to have personalized medicine, especially for mental illnesses? One of the problems is that the illnesses are increasing. The diagnostic methods that we currently use are subjective, and treatments are often based on trial and error. So we try one drug, and if that doesn't work, we try another one. If you look at data from the United States for 2008, this represents the number of people suffering from mental illnesses in millions in, in one particular year. And the numbers are enormous. And if we take this across the world, they're staggering, the number of people that are impacted by this. And it's not just individual suffering, but it's suffering within the families and impact on overall life. All these diagnostic categories are coming out of DSM, and I find it fascinating that the depth of DSM knowledge grows and grows, and the criteria that we use get broader and broader to describe our disorders. And one of the big problems with DSM is, I, I believe, is that we've moved from more of a uh, pathological condition into a medical model, so we describe symptoms and clusters of symptoms, and it's not biologically based. 
And I think we need to move to a biological basis for mental disorders if we're going to try to relate, as we've heard here today, our illnesses to genes and biological processes. I don't think we can relate them to the medical model. We need another way to look at diagnosis. So the problems in diagnosing mental disorders are that it is subjective. There's heterogeneity in the categories. There's extensive comorbidity in mental illnesses. It's, it's interesting today, in these two days, we've heard about many illnesses being discussed, and they all are presented as one illness. But are they really one illness? Are they multiple illnesses? And I think we have to look at this with greater, cl greater clarity. There, there's overspecification of illnesses, and therefore, there's a lot of not otherwise specified categories. And the biggest problem is at the bottom line, which is following the end, is that these diagnostic systems drive our research, clinical trials, journal publications, and FDA approval. And I and many others don't believe that they're doing an adequate job. This gives you an idea of comorbidity. It is enormous across all these disorders, and the leader is bipolar one. They have the most comorbidity of all illnesses. But when we do studies, we talk about one disorder, not many. The other issue that comes up in treating mental illnesses is who does the treatment? Well, ideally, you'd like to see psychiatrists treating the mentally ill, but in reality, more people go to a general medical service for treatment. And then you run into problems because they don't do a great job in terms of the treatment. And the, the people who work, the, the practitioners are, who work in the general medical field, while they're good, they don't have enough time to, to deal with the subtleties of mental disorders and don't give a thorough diagnosis. So we have perfect drugs, we think, or at least we hope we've been developing perfect drugs. And then why does the treatment fail? Well, these are a couple of reasons. One is, as I mentioned a few times, diagnostic accuracy and comorbidities treatment effects. So you start with one drug, add another one, maybe without stopping the previous one. So there's polypharmacy. Dosage, length of treatment are all factors. And then there's the environmental interactors. Does the patient comply with taking the medications as prescribed? Does he adhere to all the things that are supposed to be going on? And then the factors we don't know about, external factors like trauma. So. What does personalized medicine offer for you? Can we be clear what would happen? Hopefully, with understanding the genomic regulation, disease processes will be able to provide accurate diagnostics, appropriate treatment, predict risk or onset of illness, predict response to therapy, support remission and cure of disorder, and define etiology. All of these things we hope will come out of looking at the genes that regulate these illnesses. But then you have to step back and say, do genes really play a role in this? And I think we would all agree that genes do play a role, but it's, it's to different degrees in the illnesses. So major depressive disorders, I think there's enough data that says the heritability is about 37%, schizophrenia 46, and bipolar disorder 40, although at this meeting we heard a much higher figure talked about. But we do have to identify the genes that put us at risk and we need to have objective tests to do this. So I, I like to ask the question about how important is our DNA? And obviously our DNA is extremely important in terms of the way we express ourselves and it, when we express diseases. But I, I wonder how meaningful the whole genome studies are for the diseases that we're interested in. And so far, they really haven't had a high yield. And I think that part of that reason is that we have the complexity of diagnostics and comorbidity. And what may be critical to measure is not whole genome, but gene expression in the brain in particular areas at a particular time in the person's development. Also, I think that as everyone else does in this room, that all mental illnesses are multigenetic and impacted by epigenetic effects, making it even more complex. But we still have to come up with phenotypes. We don't have a choice. And they need to be objective, accurate, and reliable. 
They need to be such that they can be done on a large number of subjects and provide direct evidence of brain gene expression for an individual and useful to predict treatment response as well as other aspects of disease. One of the major problems we have is not only genetics complicated, but I think our brains are exceedingly complex. So if you think about your own brain, it has a map of the body, it has a map of the outside world, and has a map of all of your experiences. That is a lot of information that you're integrating and using constantly. In addition, the brain has 100 billion nerve cells, a million billion connections, two million miles of wire, and is very tiny, but highly connected, and the way it's connected is extremely important to our function. And this is what we're trying to understand, how it works in a meaningful fashion and how it goes awry in disease. And that complexity is huge. And we don't really know the connectivity of all the nerve cells. We're starting to try to collect that information. We don't know where genes are expressed in the brain, at what times. Again, we're starting to collect that information. So how can we move forward and solve all the diseases we would like to solve without having all this information? We're doing a pretty good job of trying to do that, but we need to work harder at it. And I think there are some ways we can do that. This is a slide I put together a number of years ago that reflects humans or animals' birth to death cycle that we have and the ways that neuroscience or anyone doing research on the brain tries to look at brain function. And the question that I have for you is you can see here we go from single neurons to whole brain studies as well as from uh, genetics up to imaging. And these all give you different levels of analysis. But the question is, how can we take all of these levels of analysis and take the information from these different levels and bring it into clinical studies? How many of these methods can we use in clinical studies? Not too many. But we could take the information that we lose, use it, learn from these basic levels, and move them into clinical types of questions that we could answer with greater efficiency and information. I think we're at a point where we have to think about doing a paradigm shift in the way studies are done. And this, I'm talking about clinical studies. And on the left side, I have the way current studies are done, and on the right side, I have what, we, what I think we need to do. So currently, most of the studies that are done are small to medium, one to two sites. We have to do multi-site large global studies. We have to be sampling a bigger percentage of patients at different sites. We all do our own unique protocols. And this is good because it provides new information, but to prove a particular disorder at its basis, we need to do standardized protocols. We need to do things the same way. We all do our own assays and uh, unique methods that we'd like to have answers to, but we need to try to do some studies with standardized assays and assessment methods. We have to move from subjective assessments to objective assessments. In particular, I think the diagnostics that we do is, is, are too subjective and they need to be much more objective. For brain disorders, we have to, I believe, even though we've heard some interesting blood measures these two days, we need to go to functional measures of, of, of the brain. So we need to have brain markers to understand what the brain is doing. And also we need to move to a system where data, data is available for all to look at and re-examine so we need to have database, and we need to be able to do data integration across systems to understand what the interactions are. No small task, all of this. So if we can define the phenotypes in this new paradigm, we would have objective standardized diagnostics and objective standardized clinical signs and symptoms, as well as the environmental data. All of this is a very big task. For functional brain markers, I can't include too many, but right now what I would include in this is brain imaging, neurophysiological measures, neuropsychological measures. And as we can develop more measures, I think we need to add them to this list. So it was really pleasing to see how many people here were reporting on measures of cognitive function. This is a nice measure, direct measure of brain activity. And this is just a restatement of those in more detail. And 
What I'd like to do now is talk about some recent activities that I and others have been involved in in terms of personalized medicine for the brain and also translational research. So in 2009, I held a meeting in Washington to look at and ask the question is, do we, do we have enough information from genomics to apply it to mental disorders? And we brought together people that represented all of the uh, aspects of care in terms of working towards personalized medicine. So we had basic researchers, clinical researchers, healthcare companies, and we spent the day talking about this. And basically, we came up with a number of, of recommendations from the meeting, which say we have to integrate the knowledge that we have. We need standardization of methodology. Studies need to be done with real world populations to meet re real world needs. And we need large studies, so harness the power of numbers. The real issue is to take all the specialization and boil it down and focus it and integrate it, the information we have to come up with what a disorder is and how to treat it best. There are some other activities that are going on to look at translational neuroscience and psychiatry. One is from the NIMH 2008 strategic plan. They are moving to develop research diagnostic criteria. And this is looking more at biology. Another one is an international study to predict optimized treatment for depression and ADH. And I'll give you a little bit more detail on that, on both of them. So the strategic plan that NIMH is developing is looking at biology. And they want to develop research diagnostic <laughs> criteria for each of the disorders looking at direct measures of brain function that are observable and quantifiable. And hopefully, if you do each of these measures across all disorders, we will come up with a way to compare disorders and, and put them into categories that are based on biology and that are not based on signs and symptoms. So it's looking at the translation of basic functional dimensions, reflecting circuit level activities and behavioral activities. And they're not limiting what measures can be used, other that they have to be generate, they have to be different units of analysis that can be independent variables, generating classifications from basic behavioral neuroscience, rather than starting with an illness definition and seeking its neurobiological underpinnings. We really want to start with the neurobiology. And this is a mock-up of what the research domain criteria would look like. And it's a construct of looking at behaviors which are listed on the left, going across genes to circuits, cells, molecules, self-reports. And it, as this gets filled out, one is looking at a, a documentation of disorders that can then be looked at more significantly with genes and treated better. In the iSpot study, they've taken an approach of standardized methodologies and protocols. And the study includes a uh, slightly over 2,000 people at 20 sites around the world in a treatment study with, with three different drugs for depression. And they're sampling genomics and doing magnetic resonance imaging, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and DTI, and looking at EEG and evoke potentials and autonomic arousal, measuring cognition, and other psychological tests and personal history. And the study is also incorporating the, the regular measures of diagnostics. So you can look at DSM criteria, ICD criteria. But what we want to see is more like what our doc is looking at. What's the basic biology of these disorders? And can you come up with biological tests that segregate together to say that an individual will do best on this type of drug? Recently did an edited book on integrating neuroscience and personalized medicine. And we have about 15, 20 chapters in there where we've asked people to focus on what are the genomic and physiological and psychological behaviors that are associated with any disorder. And well, it was educational to do this book. It's also controversial in the, in the sense that some people look strictly at genomics 
measures. Other people try to combine lots of measures to look across disorders. But nothing right now is really ready for personalized medicine, but we have to move it in that direction. And most of the problems that you see in, that are reported here are small studies, non-reproducibility, and we have to get to the point where we can test all of the leads that are there. Well, there are many, but they need to be replicated. So if we want to move to personalized medicine, there are other issues other than basic understanding of an individual disease. We need to establish electronic health records that are functional and informative to the treating physician. We need clinical decision support systems. So this means how does the clinician interpret the record of the person's history and new information that we learn about classifying disorders and what's the best treatment and how do they use bio biomarker information. There's other issues that go across the reimbursement and people are suggesting to ha perhaps have financial methods that include paying for performance outcomes, not just clinical service delivery. So to summarize, I'm a strong proponent of saying that new studies need to include functional brain measures. And these could be seen as surrogate gene expression markets. And we need real world samples of patients, including those with comorbidities. So we need standardized objective methods and protocols databases and data sharing. We need more than one therapy to be tested in every situation. There has to be a replication design within the, within the study, a statistical and analysis plan, and we need to report sensitivity and specificity of measures. And one would think that all these things are always done, but if you look at many publications, they're not there. Obviously, the patient will benefit from all of this and will inform us about impending disease will have accurate diagnosis, effective treatments, treatment responsiveness, and also prediction of side effects. And we could actually say when we have a disease remission or, or cure. Those are the ultimate goals. So is personalized medicine all good? I think there's a lot of issues out there that we have to be careful about and concerned about as we move into this area. Uh, somebody we know very well who's here made this statement back in 2004 that covers both the area of personalized medicine and translation research. Uh, Julio put in one of his editorials at Molecular Psychiatry, as the immense progress has been made in basic research, the challenge is now to translate fundamental discoveries from the area of pure science to the reality of healthcare, leading to better preventive approaches, more refined and successful treatments, and improved healthcare. I mean, he's really saying there, translation of research will lead to personalized medicine, even though those, those are not the words that he used. So when do we do this? Uh, one would have to say that we need to be doing it now. We are starting to do it now. And as this graph demonstrates, if we do it, we can collect the information that we will save an awful lot of cost in terms of our efforts to treat and cure diseases. Interestingly enough, this is Francis Collins at the NIH, and I think, I, I don't know for sure, but when I said that we started talking about translational neuroscience, it was in the late 80s and 90s, we did this at NIH. And now this is being revisited again there, where they are going to have a national center for advancing translational sciences. And he talks about establishing a center for translational medicine. So we're, we are revisiting it, even though it's been claimed we should be doing it all along. And hopefully this will add enough money. Somehow US 650 million for this effort doesn't seem to be enough, but it's a start, but it's a revitalization of looking at translational sciences. And lastly, I think that, you know, the, the couple of books that I published in the past few years deal with databasing and, in, and personalized medicine and I think the two really interdigitate very well. And we do need to database all our information and leave it open for others to look at. And that's my message. I hope that I can convince some of you to think about it and that you would uh, let me know where I'm thinking about it the wrong way and better ways to improve it. But how can we come up with solutions to treat people who are 
have illnesses of the brain and do it in a better and more efficient way. And I thank you for your attention.